So good afternoon and welcome. My name is Lauren Hodson and it is a pleasure to be here today uh, in the same space as Rob and Carla. Often for those of you who have been part of an EDGE webinar in the past, you see a few different video screens uh, as presenters are in different places, but because we're all here at the General Counsel Office in Toronto, we thought we would all be in the same room together. So welcome to Rob Deglish and Carla Langhorst, who are our presenters today on the topic of real estate. So I'm wondering if you could both tell us a bit about what you do uh, with EDGE, and then we'll move into the real estate topic. So Rob, you want to start us off? Sure. So EDGE is uh, an initiative of the General Counsel, and uh, it was to focus resources on ministry renewal and new ministry development. And uh, I guess I'm the executive director, so uh, I'd be in the strategy, business development. Uh, I say business development. Uh, this is, might be a segue to Carla's role, but uh, <laughs> um, it is we operate differently than the general counsel generally, and we're uh, kind of like a little pseudo church. Uh, entrepreneurial venture, mm -hmm. uh, but we're technically part of the General Counsel Office. So uh, I've been involved in that from the beginning, and actually before the beginning, in forming the vision for it. So. Great, fabulous. And uh, I'm Carla Langhorst, and I'm part of the EDGE team. And uh, my main role here is really new ideas, and really listening for feedback, seeing what are some of the trends out there, some of the ideas, and uh, piloting those. So. Does it make sense to do center of procurement? That was one of the pieces that we launched, being Buying United. And then also, when we were speaking to congregations, real estate, uh, property, it really was something that was being demanded at needing support, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Fabulous. So both of you have uh, involvement in the property side of things in, in similar and different ways, and really looking forward to hearing both of your expertise. Everybody has involvement <laughs> in the property. It's become... Uh, a large part of our focus. I imagine. <laughs> uh, and maybe just to start off by saying a little word about that. Um, uh, for a long time, I have felt there's been a need for some uh, resource to help congregations deal with property issues. It's very complex uh, territory, and congregations are often not well equipped or a little bit equipped, uh, you know, so they go to a local real estate person who may not. Uh, be well informed about the larger picture in different kinds of property, and especially churches are very particular kinds of property. Um, or congregations get involved in doing a property piece, uh, selling off part of their property to support a ministry that's struggling to give them some time. And often what that ends up doing is uh, enabling the continuance of a problem that needs to be addressed maybe a change in model or some kind of renewal of the mission or vision of the congregation. And so you begin to use the legacy assets uh, to continue to do something that's not working. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, but it really came home in the comprehensive review consultation when we saw that maybe a thousand United Church congregations would be redeveloping or selling mm -hmm. uh, in some form over the short term, five to seven or ten maybe at the outside years. And uh, we knew there needed to be something. And then, as Carla said, the demand started coming in. And as soon as we started doing work, the demand started coming very, very quickly. So we're actively working with over 50 congregations already. So if you think of 50 development projects, mm -hmm. we don't do all of that work, but we uh, connect with people to help bring resources to it. It's huge. And now we're talking with presbyteries about a regional strategy around how they look at their whole uh, presbytery, ask the question, what are the property resources, what are the ministry resources, and then at the communities, what are the missional opportunities, and how do we realign, use the resources um, to be effective and vital in mm -hmm. mission. And that's the good news is, uh, you know, congregations think of their property as a problem often mm -hmm. to keep the heat going and so on. Uh, the good news is, if we look at our property differently and our resources and the asset, the gift that it really is, we can redirect and reallocate resources and restructure them in a way that allows us to make the shifts for vital ministry going forward. And we see wonderful examples uh, of that already. Uh, and I, I just had a conversation this morning with a couple of presbytery development officers, and they're saying that presbyteries are now in the situation where they're getting 
significant assets from the sale of property. And the question is, well, what do we do with what? that uh, multi-million dollar <laughs> pot? Yeah. And so uh, this allows us to, you know, we've got the resources to do a, a, a well-designed plan that not only uh, deals with the property effectively, highest and best value, uh, but also is directed in a way that enables the mission to go forward in new ways, mm -hmm. to do the retooling, to do, uh, to provide full-time employment for ministry, for example. Anyway, so that's what drew us into this. Awesome. I, and I love that this this is you know the first slide. This is the starting point, connecting with um, the gift of ministry and also the missional aspect of it. Um, So which so, one do you want yeah, to no, start lead off, us in here? I'll start off on this one, although this is very small. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so we have been doing this work for maybe a year and a half. Uh, we've developed a process, uh, not only brought resources, but developed the process. And there are different, different situations that congregations may find themselves in. They may be um, doing a total redevelopment. And so they're going to look at their property in a new way. Uh, there may be revenue generation uh, options uh, in terms of housing or other ways that property can be used to generate income. Uh, there may be uh, the redevelopment of a facility. Uh, there may be some housing as part of it. Um, and uh, the trick always is to make sure all of that falls in line with the missional vision. Uh, or a congregation may be just looking at the facility as it exists and updating it. Uh, if you've had the experience of walking into some United Churches we get to do that a lot across the country. Uh, often, you know, if I've done a number of congregations, I start to wonder whether something stopped in the 60s because uh, hmm. a lot of our development happened around that time and it kind of has that feel. And so congregations are needing to update and um, often um, uh, in a time of financial stress, the, the kind of due diligence and planning around the upkeep of the facility doesn't happen in the same way. So there is the need even just to have a, a facility plan and an update uh, maintenance plan, uh, both structurally, a roof, furnace, and so on. But some, sometimes it's just kind of redoing the inside of the congregation, the, the facility, to better suit the current mission needs of the congregation. Um, sometimes uh, congregations are maybe coming to the end of uh, their life cycle, and so they're looking at the sale of property uh, and at that point, questions of legacy and what is the uh, ongoing use of these resources that come out of that, and often the presbytery is involved mm -hmm. uh, in that as well. And, and there's a need for legacy planning around that because um, we noticed, and we didn't intend to be, you know, edges right, around new ministry development, we didn't really expect to be involved in closing churches. Yeah. But life and death goes together, yeah. and that's the Christian story. And we found out it, it's actually true in our yeah. practical day-to-day -day living. And uh, it's often at the death of something that something new is born. And you also, if you're going to honor life, you need to honor the time of death. And so we, we haven't been doing that well. Mm -hmm. uh, a congregation dies, but not all the people do mm -hmm. <laughs> necessarily. And so what happens to those people? How are they cared for? How, how do they bring closure? And so we've developed some uh, processes around that. And uh, so I think I've covered kind of the, the, uh, the main pieces there. Maintenance, planning, like do you have a facility plan? And often congregations can get caught in a situation where they feel they're under, they're in a kind of maybe crisis or in a difficult situation financially, but a lot of those pieces may still be hidden mm -hmm. uh, because, well, if you don't have a, a facility maintenance plan, there's a hidden deficit that doesn't become visible until you need $200,000 to fix a roof mm -hmm. or a structural problem with the walls or a, a furnace. Um, and other ways that sometimes uh, the, the financial distress is hidden is in processes of either fantasy budgeting. Uh, we're we're going to increase our revenue by 40%, but without a real plan to do that, yeah. or deficit budgeting. So we've made our budget, but why? where's that deficit coming from, and what is it supporting? Yeah. If you're supporting new ministry, that's fine. If you're keeping something going, it's not working, that's crazy. Um, or sometimes we don't look at the structure of our donor base. 
So many congregations, 50% of their income comes from people over 80. Mm -hmm. And um, that requires a 10-year plan yeah. that looks like this, and you need to kind of find the other. So that's those are the different situations congregations find themselves in. Great. So this slide gives us sort of the big picture, and you're going to talk now a bit more about really specifically about three of these areas. So we're going to talk about development, renovating, and selling. Uh, so we'll we'll move into those areas. If you have any questions coming up, that's kind of where we're going from here. And Jeffrey has just asked if these slides will be available. So uh, just so you all know, they, they can be and will be made available. Sharon uh, sends out a, a follow-up email after all of our webinars, and she's just offered to attach the slides to that email, so you'll all have access. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, Jeffrey. Uh, the slides will be available, and there's a lot more material that is Absolutely. readily available <laughs> that can give more detail around some of these things if you just uh, send us an email and ask. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so next. Carla will talk next. Yeah. We'll get to hear from you. Um, so here's here's the question. How do, how, how do you know that development might be the option for you? And um, we, we often have situations where uh, the impulse to do a redevelopment is driven by a sense that we can't make it work financially, and so we're going to do a development to try and fix that. And that's, that's okay as an impetus, but that's not, uh, that's not a state of preparedness mm -hmm. to do a development, um, because development projects require enormous uh, energy. And so you, you need to ask yourself, do you have kind of the volunteers and the, the energy to carry something forward? And sometimes the idea of a development can re-energize mm -hmm. people and can gather people, and that's fine. Um, but it needs also to be missionally driven. And so uh, is the congregation interested in, and not just interested in, but willing to do what's necessary uh, to engage a renewal process, to reconsider the models of ministry, maybe box, book, and preacher, um, you know, a church building with worship on Sunday morning and a professional person that does that, uh, maybe that's not the model that's going to be viable going forward or that God is calling you mm -hmm. to be doing in the best way to serve this community. Uh, and so uh, redevelopment offers you the opportunity to rethink uh, the shape of the ministry and how the property can be doing that. It's one of the prime reasons we're involved in this because... Um, the, the reimagining of the property is a potent way to begin to reimagine the shape of the ministry mm -hmm. and to actually get out of the box that you're in in order to respond to the missional call of the new thing that God is doing today through the church and, and also in your community. So, but, but you've got to take those questions seriously. And we have seen, because if you don't, um, you end up, and we've seen this happen, you end up cannibalizing the property. Uh, to keep a ministry going that yeah. really doesn't work and needs to change. So you put off the change. You don't kind of give yourself more time. That's often the story we give ourselves. You're not giving more time to do it. What you're doing is putting off facing the change that's, that's upon you. So if, if there's volunteers and some willingness and some energy to do it, then the opportunities are significant. Mm -hmm. And often the property can provide the financial resources to, uh, to make it happen. Okay. So we do have a process, and this is very high level again, so um, you can work with any of the support that we have within the United Church, or just follow this process in general, hopefully, as a guideline. So the very first part is the intake, and the, although it sounds scary, an intake, really what it's supposed to do is figure out where your congregation is today, and where you're looking at going in the future. So does develop, how does development come into play with those factors? And so when you look at that, we would look at some of the criteria being like, do you have the energy and the volunteers and the willingness to change? And um, what are we missing? Mm -hmm. So that would be the point at which we start identifying any of those gaps because it's only by going through that assessment that we're able to come up with a plan to fill those gaps and move forward. The next one here, and you're going to see a theme throughout this webinar, is that we talk a lot about community roundtables. <laughs> and that's about 
reaching out. So getting out of our building. Sometimes the walls, they kind of keep us in. And um, really the community round table, let's get some people in there with us talking about the community. And really this is a great starting point to be a catalyst for energy, to get to uh, really that excitement mm -hmm. in the congregation about what opportunities are out there. And you're going to be shocked and amazed at some of the various collaborative partners that are really genuinely willing and wanting to work with yourself as a congregation as United Church. And I think that alone is very exciting. So at that point in time, now that we have some ideas and we're starting to get some traction and some energy and maybe more people wanting to be part of this team and this initiative, that's when we have to really figure out whether or not the dollars and cents make sense. So we do the feasibility, we look at some of those ideas, and that's where we start to engage some professionals to say, what are there, is there anything that we're missing? Because sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees, the round table's part of branching out from that, but also having some professionals who do this for a living are objective about our church building, because we're not. We're very emotional about it, and, that, and that's good. Um, but having someone to give a different lens to looking at our church property. And then we're able to compare them, make a decision, and that's when we can really plan. So just to recap, going through these four steps, we really did an assessment of where we are, what we're missing. Then we start branching out, looking for other ideas. Then we put some numbers to those ideas to see if they're feasible. And then we can decide an action plan moving forward. So this is, I mean, very high level. Clearly, development is not this easy, but it gets us moving in a direction that makes sense for our congregation. And just to add into that, in the um, the ideas, and really when you're looking at the opportunities, the missional conversation happens yeah. alongside of these. And so exploring new models of ministry that might be applicable to, or that you might be able to do through a redevelopment or with the community partners that are at the round table. So... And there is, there is this whole movement uh, emerging. People Your congregation, uh, do you know where you'll be in 10 to 20 years? Uh, because uh, if you're investing in something, uh, it needs to be for some missional purpose. And, uh, you know, some people invest large, the typical update is in some kind of elevator or lift mm -hmm. process. And uh, those are huge investments. And But you've got to ask yourself the question around what is the place of that huge investment in leveraging the ministry going forward? And, um, you know, it, who, who is actually going to be using it? And is that the, the mission of the church? Um, so do you have a clear mission and vision? If you don't, you need to get that before expending these resources so that you know there's an alignment or do, the, do it alongside of that. And uh, are you experiencing renewal? And therefore, what are the facilities that you may need in order to really foster and, and build that forward? So that's, uh, those are some of the questions around uh, that you need to ask if you're considering renovating. So now we jump into the process again. Okay. And it is fairly similar to the development in terms of the very high levels that we're talking about. Again, the intake of where you are, where are you right now? What are the gaps that you have? So the same there. But it's a little different at this point in time is that the community roundtable is designed more instead of just getting in general ideas, which are still important. The key focus now is if you're renovating, well, who are your partners? Mm. And so are there different space requirements that they have in this renovation of what your church building will look like in the future? Um, and is that why you're getting a lift? Is that why you're doing accessibility? If that's not the reason why, well, do you have different building requirements? So you kind of have your wish list at this point in time. You have the partners in place so that it's a little bit more formalized. I mean, as opposed to um, the Field of Dreams movie, if you build it, they will not <laughs> necessarily come. 
So what we want to be doing is we actually want to know that they're going to come up front and then build it. So it's really reversing that. Mm -hmm. uh, then the third stage here is now that we have our building requirements of, you know, this is our wish list, and here are the people who are coming to the table with us. Well, what does that look like when it comes to the financials? So is it going to be a $100,000 renovation? Is it going to be a $500,000 re renovation? Is that coming all from the congregation? Or are our partners actually coming to the table with some of these resources? Um, maybe there might even be resources within the community. Are there other places to be looking? And so once we have the building requirements, what's actually possible, having a budget is attached to that, that's where we actually have to make sure that financially it's going to be viable moving forward. But it does start definitely in making sure that your ministry is doing some of these renewal best practices. We're seeing those trends. We know where we're going to be in the next 20 years. We have the partners in place. And then we invest this type of money behind that. So for each of these different processes, I mean, we see kind of similarities yeah. and, and differences. Um, but for each of them, the, the value in the parallel missional piece along with the, yeah. the building piece. Yeah. And just to be clear, I mean, what we're, what's happening over time is we're framing what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So we experience congregations that do a number of things, and these seem to be the categories that make sense at the moment. Yeah. Um, they usually change over time. <laughs> <laughs> So um, selling is, uh, is a viable mission option. Often this is associated with uh, congregations who are either deciding that the, the ministry that's in the form that it's in now or the congregation is at coming to an end. Or maybe uh, they're in a conversation around some kind of collaborative ministry. Uh, we, we often talk about amalgamation. That's only one form of, of collaborative ministry. Mm -hmm. um, there is a situation of a congregation in Calgary that sold their property because they believed they no longer needed a building to do the ministry they were called to do. So they stayed as a, as a congregation. They use space in other congregations, but they also work collaboratively in some form with those congregations around a mission for the city, for their neighborhood. Um, so selling can be some kind of collaborative ministry, um, or it could be just the, the ministry they're called to doesn't require uh, a church building. Uh, house churches is another example of this. So um, are you closing? And if you are, uh, that also means maybe you are the one to decide what happens, or maybe the presbytery mm -hmm. is the person to decide, but it may eventually lead to a situation where you're selling. Um, from my point of view, I, I'm at the point where I need to be convinced that we don't have a missional use for the property. Uh, because if you open up the, the lens a bit, both in terms of the larger region, the mission of the church nationally, and the mission 100 years from now, if you sell a property in Toronto, you're not getting it back, or in many cities across uh, the, the country. So uh, our Sometimes our impulse is to sell because a congregation is closing, but we need to ask the larger missional question. Before we go on to the next slide, um, Gloria is asking a question that I think kind of relates to all these different avenues, and she's wondering about bringing in professionals. Um, and she's asked, do we bring in professionals for the building requirements and the budget stage, or where, where is the point where, where you're consulting with various professionals? Um, so for each of the various different aspects, it would be different. So for development, uh, I think that really having someone on your side from the get-go is important. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely want to have more information up front prior to speaking to a developer, yes. prior to speaking to even a funder, because what ends up happening, and uh, I, I'm actually quoting Michael Wright on this one, is that what ends up happening is that if you actually go to a partner first, and then um, you say, I want to do something, well, it's always going to be based on their objectives rather than your own mission. Mm -hmm. right? So if you go and you've made a decision based on what is best for your congregation and for the missional alignment, 
and then show that story and show that concept to prospective partners who are a good fit with that, that's the better way to go. But in order to have that story created, you do need some professionals on your side to get there, gather the information, know that it's feasible so that you're not going to the first person getting it shot down. So for the development, earlier is definitely better. Um, There's certain pieces that you might not need up front. Uh, for instance, getting uh, a survey uh, of your building or having someone do a building inspection for you. For development, I mean, if we're starting from scratch and we don't know which way we're going, there's no point in spending $15,000 for a building inspection up front. We shouldn't be doing that until it's required yeah. or if it's required. So just knowing the steps and knowing which professionals to engage at the right time, that's sometimes the challenge. Um, and that's definitely something that Edge is here for you. If you do have some of these questions, please contact us. Uh, the Presbytery would also be a resource for you. Uh, but definitely there are people within the United Church who are here to help on formulating who to reach out to first. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll just add to that. The, the key is you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And especially around property, the, the value of a property, for example, can be radically different depending on something you may not know around uh, rezoning options, around uh, density, and so on. So it's really important to get the professional advice, mm -hmm. but it's also important to uh, get a relationship with someone you trust uh, because they may have their own ideas around uh, who gets the lift or what's possible with the property. And the most important antidote to this is to be clear around what your uh, missional objectives are for the property. Yeah. And I guess I could just do some red flags of which professionals not to start with. <laughs> that mm. might be the way to go. Is We don't want to start with um, a structural engineer, typically, because especially if you're looking at various options, well, until you figure out what you want to do, you don't you don't have to worry about what your existing building looks like, unless you are planning on your, you're doing a maintenance plan of expecting not to make any changes. And if that's a viable option, that's the time you'd have a structural engineer. The second professional that you would want to wait for and probably have someone first is an architect. And the reason being on this is that as soon as you have some drawings, um, your entire, yourself, myself, the entire congregation will see that drawing and they'll say, well, that's what it's going to look like. And then all of a sudden, that's the only path that people can see. And we want to make sure that We've actually done some of the financial testing, the viability testing, and even know of, from a planning perspective if that's even possible before we start showing diagrams. And those diagrams are costly. So save and, that And later. to reiterate what you said before, a developer <laughs> yeah. is probably not the oh, person. Oh, and not a developer. <laughs> start with. Yeah. So there's a few people not to be starting with, but until we actually know exactly where you're at, it would be hard for us to say exactly who to start with. And that, I mean, that's one of the gifts of being part of a national denomination and right. connected to EDGE, for example, or presbyteries, or um, that there are resources out there yeah. that can help communities know who to connect with. Yeah. And that you know, each time a community is doing this, they're not starting from scratch. They don't need right. to be starting from yeah. scratch in terms of those relationships. Yeah. Right. And I guess that's one really important thing is that if, as soon as you are, we are engaging with professionals or people outside of our own congregation, it's always thinking, okay, so why are they doing it? Or what's in it for them? And I mean, the developer, when they are working with you, it's because there's something in it for them. Whereas uh, working with the United Church, I mean, we're all on the same team, mm -hmm. right? And that's and we're all doing the same thing. And I think that that's a really important part to realize that that's, that's why some of these supports are being created, is to really genuinely support as opposed to for any other reason. Um, Jeffrey here is uh, just going back to Rob, you referring to a church in Calgary that uh, <laughs> left their building. Uh, he's just noted, he, he's wondering, is, thinks it's St. Andrews in Calgary, um, and he's put a, uh, the website um, and told a little bit about that community. So just, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there are stories out there that, yeah. that draw us together as well, exactly. yeah, and that we can collectively learn from. And, thank um, you, Jeffrey. Yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. Um, so the selling process, uh, so if you have decided to investigate the selling, the really tough thing, I think, with uh, church buildings in general is just understanding who would be a potential buyer. And so what we always look at, again, is where are you at right now? Um, do you have all the resources that you need in order to get your church building to be saleable? Some, some actually, there are no buyers for them. 
Uh, in other places, there's buyers who might be another faith community, or it could be very different, very different from what we imagine would be someone who would buy one of our churches. Uh, so we start with really the intake of what resources do you need. We do the legacy support. So there's going to be lots of important items within the church. It could be um, as simple as a pew. It could be as simple as, I don't know, a pillow. It could be uh, as complex as a stained glass window. Right? So what, what's important to keep, uh, what's a must keep, uh, what are things that, you know what, they go with the church. And so understanding that and walking through that process of, of closure. Just say, yeah. uh, again, uh, regardless of the process, but most importantly around the legacy support, is the spiritual practice of lament mm -hmm. as the tradition's gift to us around facing change as a community. Um, the, the, the scripture is full of resources for the Psalms and so on around how to do that. It's a spiritual practice that we do well. We do it at every funeral, uh, and we need to engage it in the cases of change because every change involves loss, not just closure. And if you can't process loss, you can't do change very well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, Then the real estate support services. So depending on um, what's needed, we, do, uh, we would be able to refer appraisers to you. Um, we do have relationships with uh, real estate agents as well. Uh, and then the really tricky one is, let's say it isn't saleable. So we would actually support you in helping getting the church to be saleable by bringing in the appropriate professionals. So it can be very, very simple. It can be very, very complex. Uh, the other side is sometimes it makes sense to actually consider rezoning to make it saleable. So going through that uh, process as well, which often does increase the value of your property, which would allow for you to do more work in terms of the legacy side or continuing to provide missional support within your community. Fabulous. Fabulous. So all throughout the past half hour, you have both talked about different supports that are out there. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about some of these, these areas of potential support? Well, let's just turn to the creed. <laughs> you are not alone. Uh, there are many congregations doing this, and they're, you know, the, one of the gifts of, uh, of a united church and of a, being a church community uh, is that there are, you know, there are things you can draw. So EDGE is in the process of developing and has developed a number of resources to specifically help with these processes. Um, but there's also uh, resources often in your presbytery, the property committee, maybe there's a presbytery development uh, officer, um, conference, uh, you could call your conference office and uh, see if there are resources, uh, uh, whether one of the um, committees or divisions uh, addresses this specifically, it's an issue for all of us, mm -hmm. and so often there are resources specifically there. Um, we have uh, worked with uh, the General Counsel Office to develop a, a real estate planning fund. Um, some of the funding is can come from CMHC if there's a housing Lower the and in that case, that's what the real estate planning fund is for. If you're looking at other than housing options, where where uh, either redevelopment or the sale of the property would lead to resources that could repay the loan, then we can kind of do the upfront uh, funding through that.
United Church Foundation. Other uh, non church foundation it's, uh, uh, we're currently uh, not to focus over unduly on Calgary, but Uh, the Calgary Foundation is in conversation with us uh, because cities are very Very interested in churches who are looking at using their property to love the neighborhood, and, and so City foundations like Calgary Foundation can, can provide funding for this uh, kind of work, and we're in conversation with them around. And, uh, Press free wide. Strategy there. Uh, and uh, uh, and of course other not for profit. Partners and uh, I don't want to pre preempt one of the examples you might be using later, but to, you know. Through these uh, community round tables, you might find out that there are partners. Right Right around the corner that you just didn't anticipate. Oh, well, this is actually your conversation. <laughs> this is a private school. Oh, no, 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 this is a congregation. Yeah. But there was a gymnasium in the congregation, and just By holding a community round table, mm -hmm. having the people in the building 
this private school that doesn't have a gymnasium noticed the church did have a gymnasium and there's a natural opportunity for the partnership. So, and I mean, and I mean the, um, the oh, the value of partnership um, comes out in so many ways when we did uh, United Future Property Discussion Forum a, a number of months ago. That, that really became, I think, the central focus of, of that time. And, and we really heard through that the the value of this spiritual practice of sharing, um, and you know the So looking and connecting with those partners, being part of that. And, and that's the, I mean, the, just to reiterate, Great part of that property grounds us in the mm -hmm. literally, it is the reason it's the first. metaphor of salvation in the uh, biblical narrative right the promise of a land of a place where community and God, God and creation come together. And um, so that, that's one of the compelling reasons why we're, we're doing this work. I think that's a great intro, I think, to the next slide. Lauren, yeah. Because, um, what we really recommend yeah. from this webinar um, and, and and in general is that you've seen that each and every one of the processes really we talk about the community 
in your rotation. And so if we could get at every single congregation to investigate one tool, one uh, tactic. in order to experiment and see how to move forward. Forward, it would be the round table. Hmm. So try out a community round table. And there's lots of uh, Great reasons to just this next slide. Yeah. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure if this is cut off in our view. A little bit. I'm not sure if it's cut off for others. Uh, it says something. Like, if you only take one thing away from, from this. Yeah. <laughs> if you only try one thing, try out the community round table. So tell us a bit more about that. So this really outlines all, all the advantages and, and everything. that you would get as a congregation by, by doing one of these. Uh, but really the key thing is that there's energy and there's hope. And that's really what we're always, you know, you know that's what we need to have, especially in changing times. And, and so that's what we've seen. Um, I always thought that the big, big take away would be the fact that external parties uh, come into the church community, take a look around and say, oh, wow. Uh, 
no, um, this is how I view you, you and these are the feel good. But that wasn't actually a big takeaway. The big takeaway is the reverse. is that hmm. how the congregation rallies and, and did something successful, brought all of these community groups into one room, and it was a successful community. The round table and having that small win was actually the energizer. So there's lots of other reasons to do them. Um, and we really, we've highlighted four case studies. Uh, We've done 15, 20 now from community round table. Across the country. The nice thing is that if, if you are in Interested in doing one of these? We, we have have completely free available to you the template to run. Them. 